code. Then in September 1941, the Italian Secret Service broke into the U.S. Embassy in Rome and stole the codebook used to encipher all U.S. diplomatic messages. The thieves copied the codebook and returned it to the safe without anyone knowing. Now, Rommel could read all embassy transmissions about the British campaign. Armed with information about British troops and tanks, Rommel launched a bold assault through Libya, pushing the British back 300 miles in 17 days. The news that reached Churchill painted a grim picture of defeat. Now the British needed their own intelligence coup to reverse the disaster. At Bletchley Park, the codebreakers raced to crack the daily rotor settings. Some breaks came in only six to 12 hours. Still, lives might be saved if the operation could be speeded up. The gifted codebreaker, Alan Turing, had long been intrigued by the idea of building machines to automate the code-breaking process. The Poles had built such a device before the war, but Turing set out to improve on their ideas. Turing's goal was to build a machine that could figure out how the German operators had set up their enigmas for that day's messages. Using stock phrases, or cribs, to deduce the rotor settings was the most time-consuming part of the whole code-breaking process. Alan Turing's great breakthrough was seeing that finding out the rotor settings from that crib was something that could be done by a machine. That was, uh, his, that was the great starting point and brought the whole thing into the modern age. Turing's machine was vastly more powerful than the Pole's earlier device. Curiously, Bletchley Park called it the bomb, perhaps because of the ticking noise it made while operating. An average bomb run was about 15 minutes. Occasionally, I heard we beat the Germans to the decryption. This happened when A would send B a message and B would almost immediately send back a message, a very short message which just said, I can't read you. We would get the solution faster than the other guy could decipher it for second sending. And if it was something hot, it could get out in the field before the German commander got it. The bomb was an array of electromechanical drums that simulated the rotors of the Enigma machines. The drums clicked round letter by letter, testing the thousands of possible Enigma settings, 20 every second, until the correct one had been found. Before Turing, the perceived wisdom was, you just got to go around searching for this one solution which will break a particular message. Turing said no, what you do is you use the mathematical technique of rejecting all things that it couldn't possibly be. So it was a very powerful search engine, but working in a negative sense in that it rejected millions and millions of possibilities very, very quickly and arrived at the correct answer. The bombs radically sped up the pace of decoding. By the end of the war, there were 200 of the devices at six different locations, enabling Bletchley Park to decode 90,000 messages a month. The algorithmic process, as we call it now, by which the crib and the ciphertext were processed on these mechanical systems, well, they were the most advanced, most complex processes that had ever been used in the history of the world. I can't think of anything else with its logical and statistical sophistication. It's something you should think of as years and years before its time. Meanwhile, in August 1942, Churchill traveled to North Africa, determined to reverse the Allies' fortunes. His first action was to inject fresh blood into the leadership of the Eighth Army. 
he appointed a decisive new general, Bernard Montgomery, to take on Rommel's Africa Corps. He knew from Ultra that Rommel was prepared to attack somewhere in Egypt. But where? Montgomery predicted the ridge at Alam Hafa. Monty said, looking at the ground, you will go with the Alam Hafa ridge. Some days later, we decoded a signal from Rommel saying, I'm going to attack on the 30th of September the Alam Hafa ridge, which is exactly what Monty had said. I think from that moment on, Monty was so confident of his own intelligence that he couldn't be beaten. He couldn't. Be, he, he knew everything. But Montgomery had another advantage. The Allies finally realized that the Germans were reading U.S. embassy reports on the British campaign. So the embassy changed its diplomatic code. Rommel no longer knew what the enemy was planning. Montgomery was still receiving ultra from Bletchley Park. Soon the German forces were under enormous pressure. But some of the decoders began to feel impatient with Montgomery. We felt that Montgomery did not trust the intelligence information that Bletchley Park was providing him with, because we believed in our own arrogant way that we were probably providing a service to the military that no other military had ever had in the history of warfare. On the 23rd of October, the British launched its attack at El Alamein. Our mandate from the Prime Minister is to destroy the Axis forces in North Africa. And we are going to finish with this chap, Rommel, once and for all. British intercept stations logged over 300 messages a day in the battle that followed. Bletchley Park knew Rommel's plans, his forces, and his losses. For the first time in the war, an army moved into battle with precise advanced knowledge of the enemy. Ultra told Montgomery of Rommel's critical shortages of fuel and tanks. On the evening of the 2nd of November, Rommel signaled Hitler for permission to retreat. Alamein was marvelous because you had these desperate messages from Rommel saying, Panzer army is exhausted, we've enough petrol for 50 kilometers, uh, <clears throat> Ammunition is, con ammunition is contemptible and so on. And we have between 11 and 17 operational tanks in the whole of Panzer Army Africa. Hitler replied the next day, ordering Rommel not to yield a step, either victory or death. Montgomery read the message within hours. At El Alamein, Montgomery's superior forces crushed Rommel. Yet he decided not to pursue the remnants of the retreating German army. We told Monty over and over again how few tanks Rommel had got. So Monty could have wiped Rommel off the face of the earth. Why he didn't do so, why he didn't wipe it off the face of the earth, I simply do not know. Nobody, nobody else does. Why was that three information not used? It was so full, I mean, that was, a, that was our exasperation. We were giving Monty every conceivable information about the state of Rommel's troops, and the number of operational tanks, which is terribly crucial. I mean, you know, enough, about as many tanks could be parked on the lawn at the back of this house. I mean. And uh, in desert warfare, uh, uh, no tanks and you're finished. This is the BBC Home and Forces programme. Here's some excellent news which has come during the past hour from GHQ Cairo. It says, the Axis forces in the Western Desert, after 12 days and nights of ceaseless attacks by our land and air forces, are now in full retreat. Somehow war seems the natural state of affairs. And peace, when it comes, will take a hell of a lot of getting used to. At the time of El Alamein, the U.S. had been at war with Germany for nearly a year, 